for the subject. and the first lecture here uh, in the public lecture series of the, of the Cary Institute for the new decade and, and new year. Uh, it's great to have such a, such a crowd here tonight. I see at least a couple of our trustees. Alan Shope just uh, came in here, Zibby Tozier. There's another that came in and my, my failing eyesight. Uh, shout me, shout out, please. Uh, Oakley's, Oakley is here somewhere and is, is a trustee of years past. There he is. Um, and uh, certainly I see many friends and uh, uh, frequent uh, attendees to these lectures here tonight. And we hope that you'll uh, enjoy the series that we have planned for you as the, as the year goes on. Um, in that regard, I want to mention that February 5, uh, Jim Hansen of the uh, NASA Space Agency who has been so outspoken on uh, climate change will be here to do a book signing and a lecture on his, on his book um, on uh, climate change. So uh, stay tuned for that. Now tonight, I want to do a lecture that is kind of part fun and part science. Uh, Lisa and I uh, had the opportunity to go to Antarctica three times a few years ago. Uh, as part of uh, Duke alumni travel. This is when I was on the faculty at Duke. It's probably a shameless way to get free trips to Antarctica was to go uh, down there and lecture uh, on those uh, cruises. But in the, in the process of doing that, uh, we came to appreciate both the beauty, uh, the very special place that Antarctica is, and to learn something about the science that is being done in Antarctica and the environmental issues that face Antarctica today. And so. Uh, my first uh, uh, two goals for the evening are to say let's, uh, let's have a little fun and, and introduce you to the, some of the things that we saw and did, and another is to look at some of the problems that face the Antarctic continent. The third was to recognize that Oakley Thorne, uh, again sitting right over here, is about to go to Antarctica. Um, and so we wanted to give him a little prep for what uh, he was about to experience, um, and we'll have a little fun with that as well. Uh, so without further ado, if the lights can go down, and I'll uh, switch to uh, the first slide here. Uh, so as I said, we went in 2003, 2006, uh, 2007 uh, to Antarctica. Uh, here we are in one of our first landings on the Antarctic continent. Uh, and uh, unlike Shackleton, we didn't go in a, in a sailing ship. We actually had fairly uh, plush accommodations. Um, and. Uh, enjoyed the excursion immensely. Now where do you, where, when we talk about going to Antarctica, what is, what is all this about? So here we are looking at the southern end of planet Earth. Uh, this is the Antarctic continent. Uh, even if you st strip away the ice, it's larger than the United States, lar uh, essentially a time and a half, uh, the United States. Uh, this is South America. This is Australia. Uh, Buenos Aires, generally speaking, you fly from uh, Miami to Buenos Aires, then Buenos Aires to Ushuaia. That's a four-hour flight just by itself. Uh, join uh, a crew there, uh, get on a ship, and cross Drake Passage, which is one of the roughest seas uh, known uh, around the world. That looks like a relatively short distance on this map, but it's a day and a half uh, of passage across that uh, area. And you arrive, and generally speaking, uh, tour on the what's known as the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this strange little appendix-like piece that sticks out towards South America. Uh, th the tough people that go to Antarctica say it's the banana belt uh, because it's you know it's nowhere near as cold as being down here at the South Pole and in in East Antarctica. Uh, but to give you a little idea of scale, that that's a that's a day and a half ship cruise uh, at reasonable speed, and then you can spend a week or so uh, dealing with that. Um, as I said, we uh, were able to travel in relative luxury. This is the Corinthian II uh, that uh, came out of Ushuaia and does this trip uh, even now uh, on a regular basis. And so, you know, on a, after a day of cold conditions uh, and tromping around in ice and looking at penguins, uh, you're able to come back to a mole wine or a hot toddy or something uh, prepared for you and, and make the whole thing uh, seem reasonable. If you go to Antarctica, and almost everybody that goes to Antarctica, the reason to go to Antarctica is to see penguins. 
And so I have to dwell on penguins in a couple of sequences in the course of tonight's lectures because there's a bunch of, bunches of penguins. And if you can go to Antarctica and not fall in love with penguins and the fact that penguins are cute, and if actually you can not be seen, maybe being careful not to be observed by other fellow boat passengers, trying walking like a penguin down the aisle of a boat, you're a better person than we are. Uh, these are Gen 2 penguins. These are chin strap penguins recognized by their uh, chin strap that uh, wraps around them. These are Adelie penguins, which are my favorite. They have this child, uh, childlike innocence of the white eye uh, surrounding them. Uh, and we'll talk about those a little bit more uh, as the lecture goes on. Uh, these are macaroni penguins, which have this wonderful eyebrow uh, uh, plumage uh, surrounding them. And here's a, here's a chin strap over here taking, taking a look at what's happened in the Adelie, uh, in the chin strap uh, colony. Uh, these are king penguins. Not all trips go to, to the Falkland Islands, but if you do, uh, king penguins are there in quantity. You can see there's much less ice here because the Falklands are not quite as cold uh, as the Antarctic uh, Peninsula and Antarctic continent is by itself. Uh, but a lot of squabbling and uh, you know, the nesting site uh, arguments going on in that group. Uh, you can see Magellanic penguins, which actually uh, not only live in Antarctica, but extend up into southern Argentina. Uh, with this wonderful kind of crescent-shaped uh, uh, plumage around their face. Uh, you can say, well, are we going to see lots of penguins? And the answer is yes. You can see uh, penguins, uh, penguins in quantity. Most of that back hillside's got penguins on it, too. Um, uh, but there's lots of penguins. And if anybody's worried about whether they're going to see enough penguins, uh, there are penguins in vast quantities. These are Adelis. You can see the back, the back hillside there uh, is covered with penguins. Uh, we can, you can uh, see penguins both uh, up close uh, looking at them. And if you sit down as Lisa is here uh, and are patient and quiet and don't move around, penguins are curious and will come over and uh, actually, you know, peck at your boots and, and, you know, act like they're somewhat interested in who you are and what you're doing here uh, and what's all, all that about. Uh, you can hear penguins and you can imagine vast hillsides of that noise. These are gentoos. Um, for the non-faint of heart, recognizing that all that uh, orangish uh, pink substance is guano, uh, you can experience the smell of penguins uh, at, at some distance from uh, where you may uh, first encounter them. Uh, Antarctica is also a place of other kinds of wildlife. Uh, various kinds of seals are quite common on the, on the, uh, on the shores. Elephant seals and, and uh, fur seals and uh, various kinds of, of seals that uh, have their own personalities and noise. I didn't bring a recording of that uh, particular noise. Uh, into, but, you know, again, an unforgettable look uh, of seals in that arrangement. Uh, lots of people like to see whales. Uh, whales are uh, frequently seen, and the ship uh, will often, uh, you know, stop. And uh, in fact, one of my lectures was interrupted, and somebody said, "There's a whale on the starboard side," and the room emptied. And then, as we sailed on, they all came back in. I was able to fi uh, finish uh, that particular talk. Uh, Manky whales, uh, various kinds of whales that are uh, certainly abundant down in those waters. Uh, petrels and albatross. This is the Cape petrel. Uh, seen in the waters of Drake Passage between uh, South America and Antarctica. Uh, beautiful jellyfish in the water, uh, and uh, these are treats that are not easily found, but when uh, seen, uh, certainly delightful. And of course, when you go to Antarctica, you see a lot of ice, and you can see a lot of ice up close and personal uh, on the uh, zodiacs that you're uh, uh, taken out on uh, in exploration uh, mode. Uh, ice in all kinds of shapes and sizes, uh, ice with various colors, uh, this blue color uh, being ice that has been highly compressed for a long period of time and has essentially had the air bubbles uh, squeezed out of it and recrystallized. Uh, absolutely beautiful pieces of ice uh, and landscapes of ice uh, that in the midnight sun, it's about 30 minutes or maybe at most an hour of uh, sunset, uh, the, uh, the, the twilight and those, those sunset pictures of mountains of Antarctic ice 
are absolutely unforgettable. And that brings us to our first of uh, my short kind of interludes here of, of the science of Antarctica, because what's going on with the ice and the dynamics of the ice is something that uh, should concern all of us, uh, not just for its effects on Antarctica, uh, but for the fact there's a lot of ice there, and if something happens to that massive amount of ice, we will see that everywhere with sea, sea level rise. Uh, and so what happens at the southern end of the continent, the southern end of the, the uh, uh, planet, is very much going to come back uh, to roost on all of us. Now, what's going on with Antarctic ice was certainly brought to a head uh, in 2002. It was right before we went uh, to Antarctica the first time. Uh, in that one of the massive ice shelves on the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, roughly the size of the state of Connecticut, to give you a little bit of size uh, picture on this, uh, that had presumably been there for about 10,000 years, uh, collapsed, broke off, fell into the sea as a, uh, thousands of shattered icebergs. Uh, so pick a landmark here. That's a good one in that mountain. You can find it over in this picture. Uh, you can pick that and find it here. Uh, here's the Larson B ice shelf in, on January 31, uh, 2002, from a NASA photo of that ice shelf. Uh, here it is, uh, roughly a month later. Uh, it is shattered and falling. And as I said, that, that area is roughly the, the uh, size of Connecticut. And so there's been lots of talk. And of course, this picture appearing in the New York Times and other places uh, brought this home, uh, that Antarctic with global warming, particularly focused at the poles of the Earth, uh, might be particularly vulnerable uh, and might uh, be losing lots of ice cover and contributing to a lot of sea level rise uh, worldwide. Now, when you go on an individual cruise, it's difficult to perceive that. You go there, they take you there in our winter, their spring, and of course, things are melting. And so you get to feel, oh, God, everything's melting here. Uh, but you've got to remember, it melts every spring. And the question is whether that melting is going on at a greater rate in any particular year than it did the year before, than it did 10 years before. And that, of course, is hard to, to tease out, harder to tease out, but we'll try to do a little bit of that tonight. Now, there's two big categories of ant ice in Ar Antarctica. The first is what we call sea ice. Sea ice is floating on the surface of the ocean. It's frozen from the ocean. And so it forms every year during the winter time June and July in the Southern Hemisphere, and forms a very large ice sheet of sea ice that surrounds the Antarctic continent. And then in the springtime, starting in about October and November and reaching its peak about February, right, well, right about now, roughly, it has retreated as a result of the warming and breakup of that sea ice. And you see the darker uh, shade here is what remains in the Antarctic summer. And so you get this fluctuation of sea ice that expands and contracts seasonally uh, every year, uh, depending on uh, the, the season. Now, you've all probably read that the Arctic up at the North Pole, where there's no land underneath, that's all sea ice, essentially. And there's a lot of talk about how the sea ice at the Arctic is disappearing. We may have an ice-free Arctic up there uh, by the end of the current decade. Uh, those are all things to to uh, be concerned about. Uh, mercifully, because sea ice is frozen out of the ocean and is floating on the ocean, the melting of sea ice itself does not contribute to sea level rise in the same way, way that if you have an ice cube floating in a Coca-Cola and it melts, it doesn't raise the level of, of the volume in your glass. So sea ice is an interesting index of climate change, but it really will not uh, affect the, the rise of sea level or the height of sea level uh, globally uh, as it uh, changes its dynamics. Now, there's, uh, so here's sea ice. When it breaks up, it tends to be these flattened pieces. Uh, if somebody handed you a piece of ice and said, is this sea ice or is this glacial ice? Uh, you say, okay, well, how am I supposed to know? Uh, um, you could tell because sea ice will have about uh, 20 parts per thousand parts of salinity in it, about half of seawater salinity. And that's because it's been frozen out of the ocean, and so it carries a little bit of salinity with it. Whereas glacial ice has come from snowfall, uh, which is essentially close to distilled water falling, and you, you could recognize that uh, by, mel by melting either of them in a glass and tasting it. Um, it'd be easier to do a sodium analysis, probably more accurate, but 
Um, uh, that's, uh, so flat, flat and with a reasonable salinity content. And if you look at the records of sea ice, uh, back to 1840 here up to uh, the year 2000 in this particular uh, graph, uh, there really are, very, it's very difficult to pick any long-term dynamics out of that until recent years when there is some indication of the aerial extent of sea ice declining uh, in more recent years. Uh, that is not, I'd be the first to say, a statistically significant trend, uh, unlike the Arctic, where it's very clear that the melting going out at the North Pole is unusual. Uh, it seems to be increasing in speed and, and aerial extent of ice lost. Uh, it's much more difficult to see that change in the sea ice of Antarctica, although there's certainly indications that it's beginning uh, to come on in a similar way. Now, the other kind of ice in Antarctica is what I call glacial ice. That's what a lot of people call glacial ice. Um, it is formed on the continent itself, the brown uh, part here, where snow is falling. And snow is accumulating and pressing itself into, into ice. And the same way if you were to pour a thickened batch of pancake batter out into a plate, you know, in your morning uh, cooking, it'll begin to spread outward. It'll be thickest in the middle where you're pouring into the pile, but it'll begin to spread outward. That's basically what is going on very slowly with the dy dynamics of glacial ice. Snow is falling, some of it's evaporating, that's the sublimation. The rest of it stacks up and begins to move out in all directions towards the coast. And of course, when it gets to the coast, it breaks off into large tabular or glacial type icebergs that float off into the ocean. Those will contribute to sea level rise if the rate of movement towards the, the uh, coast or the volume of ice moving towards the coast is increasing as a result of global warming. And we have reason to believe that a lot of those uh, are possible possibilities uh, right now. First thing, you can imagine if you have a plate with no edge to it and you're pouring pancake batter onto it, uh, it's going to flow out to the edges and, and off the edge into on your counter probably, but let's, let's say that's the ocean. Uh, more, uh, more easily. And of course, as these, uh, as these ice shelves break off, like the Arson B ice shelf, that has very visibly speeded up the movement of glacial ice off the general stack uh, towards the outside. And so you can look at and you find these, uh, this, these are not flat. These are your classic uh, icebergs of quite some height uh, that you see floating out in the ocean. Those have broken off the uh, glacial uh, continental ice and are beginning uh, to move out to sea. And as they melt, that will be an increased volume of water uh, that's been added to the ocean uh, and increase the volume of sea level. Now, there's been lots of controversy as to whether Antarctica uh, is increasing or decreasing in the amount of ice on the continent itself, the amount that might contribute to glacial ice. Uh, and remember, when climate change scientists are forced to answer the question, is Antarctica increasing or decreasing in its volume of ice? Somebody is asking them to provide an estimate of the amount of ice year to year on something that's as large or larger than the United States. You can imagine, you know, the variation on that makes that a very difficult uh, thing uh, to measure. Now, luckily, there's some wonderful satellites that currently are circling our planet uh, that are able to do this by looking at measures and the changes in the gravitational attraction, which is a function of the thickness of ice over, over different places. And so we're beginning to get a better handle on this. And as you look at various stations, these are just two stations picked off of the Antarctic continent. Here's one that's very distinctly from 2002 to 2009, uh, losing centimeters of ice thickness uh, over uh, that period of time. Here's another one that actually was increasing for a while and now is apparently leveled off. So you can imagine uh, in congressional hearings when people have uh, brought this up, uh, you know, pick your station. Uh, you can find places where the ice over Antarctica is getting thicker. Uh, you can find places where the ice over Antarctica has distinctly uh, gotten thinner. Here is the best map that was just published in uh, the January issue of Nature Geoscience. Uh, which is becoming, rapidly becoming, uh, one of the favorite journals of these kinds of things. Uh, but here's Antarctica. 
Here is a scale in which blue, increasing blue color shows losses of ice thickness and volume, uh, increasing uh, orangish red, uh, increases in ice volume. And you can see the Antarctic Peninsula and West Antarctica here are definitely uh, measured, again, by the satellite here, as having lost four, six, eight centimeters of ice thickness in the decade of the 2000s. But there are some places where ice is accumulating, and Senator Imhoff from Oklahoma and a few other people like to point those out uh, in those arguments. Um, and uh, again, I, you know, we can look at this. The overall Antarctic ice balance uh, today uh, seems to be negative. It seems that we're actually seeing more loss of glacial ice into the ocean where it's melting and co contributing to sea level rise than we are increasing accumulations of ice on the continent. Now, what's this mean to us? So we can look at this, and as you look at Greenland, where the ice cap is distinctly melting, West Antarctica, including the Antarctic Peninsula, where the cruise ships go, and East Antarctica, which is the uh, larger uh, portion that uh, is over to the right on the various pictures I've shown you, uh, the current contributions of ice melt in those areas uh, 0.36 millimeters per year, 0 0.30, 0 0.13, add up to about half of the overall global sea level rise uh, being recorded at uh, various tide level gauges around the planet today. And so, there, so these are the contributions from the melting in Greenland, the melting in West Antarctica, the melting in East Antarctica, uh, to the global increase in sea water volume uh, that's been observed recently. Uh, obviously, they don't add up to all of it, and the rest of it is from melting of continental glaciers, such as the Glacier National Park and in the Alps and other places where we see uh, a recession of, of mountain glaciation. Uh, we can see this in sea level rise. This is mean sea level, uh, 1880 to, to roughly the year 2000, which if you look overall in the record, it has been rising at about 1.8 millimeters per year. Just, uh, just taking a boneheaded approach and say, let's, let's put a linear regression through that. If you break this up into segments, it's interesting to note uh, that in the early part of the 1900s, the sea level rise was about 0.8 millimeters per year. Uh, then there was a long period when it increased and more than doubled to about 2 millimeters per year. And in recent years, has been going up about 3 millimeters per year uh, total sea level rise. About half of that is from an increase in volume in the sea, and the other half is from the increased uh, thermal expansion of seawater uh, as it's gotten warmer, as it expands and contributes to sea level rise. But some indication that the rate of sea level rise has been itself increasing, and I think a very good indication that uh, a good deal of that uh, may be coming from an increased movement of glacial ice in Antarctica out to the coast where it breaks off, falls into the sea, this is the analogy of your glass of Coca-Cola full to the surface, and then you drop an ice cube in. You know, then you've got a problem. It'll overflow. It's not sea ice that's floating on the surface when you start, uh, but it's the ice cube that's dropped in uh, and causes the glass to overflow. It's interesting to go back here and say, well, what would happen if all of the ice melted in these places? Uh, Greenland, West Antarctica, or East Antarctica. We're not now dealing with millimeters per year, but how much the sea would rise globally uh, if instantaneously all of Greenland melted. About 21 feet, 7 meters. Uh, East Antarctica, the massive ice sheet there, uh, close to 200 feet of sea level rise. Uh, those of you with coastal property, that now includes Lisa and me, I guess, uh, we ought to be a little worried uh, about uh, what uh, would uh, happen uh, with that kind of sea level rise. Now, mercifully, nobody thinks this is going to happen in the next 100 years. But it's not impossible for it to happen uh, in something in the order of 150 years that we might lose all of Greenland uh, at the current rate of warming. So those are, those are doomsday scenarios, but they're not just pie-in-the-sky scenarios uh, if you go out several generations. Okay, enough gloom and doom. Back to the trip. Uh, a little reality here. So when you get on a cruise ship and you start down, headed down to Antarctica, and, and you're probably scratching your head and say, uh, this is all fine, I'm going to get good food and it's going to be warm and I'm going to have a cabin. How am I ever going to see a penguin and get off this, off this ship and uh, actually interact with the continent? So here we are getting on the ship uh, in uh, Ushuaia 
And very quickly when you get out to uh, where they want to uh, take you to something interesting, you see how this is done. A bunch of zodiacs are uh, housed on the top of these ships, uh, lowered uh, down to the side of the ship uh, by brave ship crew that don't seem to mind riding down on the, on the winch system, dropped into the ocean. Uh, it's brought over to a gangplank uh, that uh, crew members can load you into. Uh, notice that the water can be fairly calm down there. It's not like you're in a raging sea at any given moment. Uh, and uh, off you go uh, with your crew leader uh, at, the, at the helm back here, uh, taking you ashore with icebergs and the uh, like side. And of course, they uh, quickly get a shuttle system of uh, Zodiacs coming out, Zodiacs going back for another load. Uh, and you arrive at the penguin colony that, uh, that is the subject of uh, great photography and, and what you came uh, to see. Um, or you can arrive at a colony of seals, which uh, show all kinds of human behavior. Uh, and uh, ev even the penguins find this kind of interesting to be uh, watching uh, from nearby. I thought the behavior of these guys was something close to a bunch of fraternity guys. Uh, lying on the shore, but uh, we won't go into that. Now, uh, okay, so the next interlude for science uh, for tonight is that the another big question facing Antarctica in particular, but a lot of the planet in general, is the whole question of ozone depletion in the ozone hole. This first was observed and cropped up uh, over Ant the Antarctic continent uh, for reasons that I'll describe uh, shortly. Uh, we've, this is a case where I think we can say tonight that we have an environmental success story, maybe not in hand, but close to it in hand, as a result of international cooperation uh, of the nations of the world. Okay, so what about ozone and uh, ultraviolet light? I've got to give you a little bit of uh, spectral physics here to have you uh, understand exactly and appreciate what's going on there. And we'll start by looking at the wavelengths of radiation uh, that might be seen coming off a body like the sun. And they come in a, uh, many orders of magnitude different uh, in the length of that radiation from very high energy radiation such as x-rays that you might uh, receive in the doctor's office uh, to relatively low energy, longer wave radiation in microwaves and radio waves. Not energy free, but longer wavelength, lower energy compared to x-rays. I mean, these will kill you with enough. Um, microwaves might make you get a little toasty, but uh, it, it, you'll survive. Um, and in the middle of the, the spectrum is what our eye can see. It's essentially the visible spectrum. It extends from 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers, roughly. And because it's a chunk out of this spectrum, the highest energy are the blue and purple wavelengths. They're the closest down here uh, to these high, short, uh, high energy short wavelengths. And uh, red is a lower energy. It's uh, you know, more similar to the infrared and microwave. And that's just a very narrow segment of the total radiation being given off by radiant bodies uh, such as the sun. Now, the ultraviolet radiation is really what we want to be concerned about in the case of ozone depletion. It's just beyond what you can see. It's essentially, it's the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. It's what's just beyond uh, what our eye perceives uh, as violet. Now, why do we care about that? Well, ultraviolet uh, is, because it's on the uh, short wavelength, high energy end of the spectrum, uh, it has a fair uh, high energy content when it strikes things, uh, such as human beings and their skin and their eyes and their uh, DNA, and can cause skin cancer and cataracts and various kinds of human health hazards, and presumably has the same effect on any biota that's out there. Phytoplankton in the sea, penguins and seals on the shore, uh, various kinds of uh, ways that things might get exposed. Okay, now a little chemistry. We'll move from physics to a little chemistry and then we'll come into reality. Uh, we want to thank the presence of an ozone layer in the stratosphere that shields us globally from ultraviolet radiation everywhere. This is true over Millbrook, it's true over Antarctica, and the way that occurs is that you have oxygen in the atmosphere. 20% of the room here, at least before I started talking, was oxygen. And it, uh, re uh, it, when ultraviolet radiation in the ultraviolet A shines on that, it can split that molecule in half. The molecule normally has two atoms of oxygen, splits them in half, 
to what we call oxygen monomers, one of those will combine with another oxygen and form ozone. Great that that's happening. In fact, it probably was difficult for life to ever evolve on land during the history of planet Earth until there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to capture ultraviolet radiation like that and shield us from a radiant rate wavelength that would have been very dangerous for anything on the surface of the Earth. Okay, now that's, that's sort of a way of producing ozone up in the stratosphere. When, once you have ozone there, it is incredibly effective at absorbing ultraviolet B radiation, which is even shorter wavelength and more dangerous, splits it back into oxygen and, and uh, uh, a single oxygen monomer. Uh, the oxygen monomer combines with another ozone, and the result of that is that you've converted two ozones to two oxygen. And so one form of ultraviolet radiation produces, uh, produces ozone in the stratosphere, and the other one destroys it. But in the process, both ultraviolet A and ultraviolet ra B radiation have essentially been screened out. That's what we want to be thankful for. So you want to be very happy that there's an ozone layer up at 30 or 40 kilometers in the, in the stratosphere. That's the good ozone. It's different from the ozone that uh, plagues Poughkeepsie and Dutchess County down here where we're trying to live and breathe uh, from air pollution. That's the bad ozone. Uh, the good ozone is essential for life on Earth. Uh, the bad ozone uh, is not uh, so good for life on Earth. And the result of that is if you look at the wavelengths of ultraviolet, the top line here is the composition that is being received outside planet Earth's atmosphere from the sun. And then if you look at sunlight on the Earth's surface, that's this lower line, there's almost a complete screening out of ultraviolet C, which I haven't really talked about yet tonight, and the dangerous wavelengths of ultraviolet B. Uh, so it's essentially, uh, that wavelength just doesn't get down to the surface of the Earth, thank goodness. Now, back in 1985, some British scientists working with the British Antarctic Survey began to measure the total amount of ozone in the atmosphere looking vertically over their station. And they used, the history of how they came to this is totally opaque, but they use a unit called Dobson unit, which is a measure of the number of molecules of ozone in a square centimeter of uh, the atmosphere taken to the top of the atmosphere. Just remember that about 300, 350 Dobson units, that's, that's a happy atmosphere. That's the way it ought to be. Uh, and they began to see a decline. The, the open data points here are their data back to 1985. They began to see a very dramatic decline in ozone uh, in, uh, over their station in Antarctica that continued on until uh, the mid-1990s. Back to, so, so to about a third of the ozone, from 300 to 100, uh, apparently it disappeared uh, from the atmosphere over their station. And this began to uh, uh, alarm a number of people. It's, well, you know, if ozone's up there and it's shielding us from ultraviolet radiation and we're losing a third of it over 15 years, uh, this is not a, not a good situation. Uh, Cherry Rowland out at the University of California, Irvine, had actually before, about 10 years before, worked out the chemistry that this, why this would happen and why it ought to happen. Um, and. Uh, he subsequently has gotten the Nobel Prize for that work, but it had kind of been parked and left beside until these observations came in from Antarctica that, in fact, it was happening. Uh, over, no over New Zealand, as the ozone began to decline, you can see Dobson units here from 310 down to 260. Ozone's declining. Uh, ultraviolet radiation at new be uh, noon began to increase. And New Zealanders and southern Argentinians and others began uh, to get concerned about this in terms of the human health hazard. Uh, the peak ozone hole uh, ever seen was recorded in September uh, 24, 1997. Uh, here's the scale, so areas that have only 100 or 200 Dobson units of ozone are in the black and purple, and you can see most of Antarctica was in that ozone hole, uh, and then as you went out to higher latitudes, uh, the ozone was up at higher levels, 300, 400 Dobson units, where it uh, the effective shield was still very much uh, present. Okay, now why, why, what did Jerry Rowland show about this and how did this happen? Uh, this has been very strongly linked to what we call fluorocar chlorofluorocarbons or freons that were developed actually 
call a spade a spade. They were largely developed by DuPont because early refrigerants, I can remember my father telling me about my grandmother's refrigerator being full of ammonia in the, in the tubes that went through it. Um, and sulfur dioxide was another thing that they used for the, the uh, refrigerant to carry the hot air out of your refrigerator and exchange it with, with coldness. Those were very corrosive gases, ammonia and sulfur dioxide. They corroded the refrigerator with rust, and if they got out, they weren't terribly good on the residents of the house. And so the idea with uh, chlorofluorocarbons was to develop something that was just as good as a heat exchanger, but didn't react with anything. And these were great compounds. Here's a typical one. It's got a carbon atom in the middle. It's got three chlorides around the outside and one fluorine. Basically inert. If you released it in the room here, doesn't react with anything, doesn't smell, colorless, odor, you know, odorless, um, perfect, and, and a high heat capacity. So it had all the properties you'd want of a compound to do the job of ammonia or sulfur dioxide without the reactivity. Now the result of the lack of reacti reactivity is they persisted in the atmosphere long enough so they mixed to the stratosphere. And this is where Sherry, Roland, and the others had worked out the chemistry that if you have a CFC and you have sunlight and you have very cold conditions, so there's ice crystals for the reaction to occur upon, that it will break off a, an active chlorine atom off that molecule. That chlorine atom will destroy an ozone, convert an ozone to an oxygen, and then cycle through some rather uh, complex chemistry and be restored as a chlorine, active chlorine atom again, and go through this cycle several hundred times, each time destroying an ozone. And so with that set of conditions, cold temperatures in the stratosphere, chlorofluorocarbon available, and sunlight that really focus the attention over Antarctica. You've got to have all three of them. I'm talking very cold conditions, minus 60, minus 80. Uh, centigrade. So we're talking uh, you know, cold, cold, cold conditions. Okay, so uh, every year if you look at the size of the ozone hole, uh, it's basically non-existent over Antarctica until the Antarctic spring uh, comes on. You know, it's been dark for 24 hours of darkness back here in, in May, June, July. Uh, but then spring comes to the southern hemisphere, uh, the, the sun starts shining, the stratosphere is very cold. It's been in the dark for six months. And there's chlorofluorocarbons that have mixed into it from the industrialized world. And you see the appearance of the ozone hole uh, coming up to uh, 20 or so million uh, uh, square kilometers. It's basically the size of the US. And then it disappears uh, towards the end of the year, not because the sun isn't shining and there isn't chlorofluorocarbon, but by that time, the, the Antarctic spring is warmed up a little bit and you've lost the cold condition. So it's got to have all three things. Very cold, ultraviolet radiation from springtime sunlight uh, and chlorofluorocarbon. Um, and uh, of course that uh, we can say, well what happens when it disappears? We have any number of medical studies uh, that show that if one looks at uh, solar radiation as an index and skin cancer, uh, that there's a pretty direct relation there uh, of increasing skin cancer. This is done with uh, different cities. So here's Seattle and here's New Mexico, essentially. Um, so the sun never shines in Seattle. Uh, if, if you're worried about skin cancer, that's a good place to live. Uh, New Mexico is uh, much worse there. Same with cataracts. If you look at ozone depletion, uh, zero, no depletion, 5%, 10%, 20%. Uh, number of cases of cataracts, uh, uh, and uh, this is the additional cases uh, that are seen over the baseline condition. Uh, so 1, 3, 4.8, 6.9% increase uh, from uh, ultraviolet light uh, causing uh, cataracts. Uh, there has been reports of cataracts on penguins in the zoo in Detroit. Um, and of course, this is enough to make you wonder whether uh, penguins in Antarctica, uh, seen like this today, uh, may be in the course of a massive evolution to a different uh, post-ozonic uh, era uh, penguin uh, configuration sometime in the, in the future. Now, I said this is an environmental success story. When Sherry Rowland worked out the chemistry in 1974, the British began to observe the ozone hole in 1985 is when they published it in the journal Nature. 
by 1990, this was science that was well enough accepted in the international community uh, that with the Montreal Protocol, chlorofluorocarbons generally were agreed, we're going to phase those out. And you begin to see a dramatic drop in chlorofluorocarbon use uh, globally. And the substitution of a hydrofluorocarbon to hydrochlorofluorocarbon, they've added one hydrogen onto the molecule in, in place of one of those chlorines and, or fluorines, which makes the molecule slightly more vulnerable to decomposition in the lower atmosphere and less of it mixes to the stratosphere. It's not without some ozone destruction, but it's a vast improvement. And so starting about 1990, we began to have a, a, a dramatic um, improvement. Well, let, let's say the ozone hole really hasn't gotten any bigger since 1990. It has not healed. It forms every year. It formed this year. I can watch it in my office on the computer, uh, and you could too at your home computer. Um, and uh, I'd show you it tonight, but we're beyond the season. It's uh, you know, the, the whole this year was peak in October and is now uh, healed up. Uh, nevertheless, you know, being a scientist, I had to deal with this on the boat because I couldn't go down there and just uh, think I was on some kind of um, complete junket. Uh, so I brought from Duke uh, some ultraviolet light meters and I was able, uh, Oakley noticed that the, this is shirt sleeve weather too, this is, uh, this is not unusual for uh, Antarctica, uh, able to go on the back of the, back of the ship, uh, measure uh, radiation, um, and I started doing this, so this is our, our last trip. Here we are in uh, Durham, North Carolina, we haven't taken out, we're taken off yet, we're at 35 degrees north. Uh, ultraviolet light a percent of the total is about 0.09 percent. And then we got down to Buenos Aires for a couple of days uh, getting ready for the cruise and it had gotten up to about 0.14, 0.16. At our southernmost uh, excursion, Cooperville Island, uh, we'd gone up to 0.18 uh, percent uh, of the total radiation uh, was ultraviolet. And so you can see this increase as we started uh, north and went south, and particularly down here in these southern latitudes, uh, 62, 65, 65 degrees uh, south. Uh, even in December, uh, I was able on the back of the ship to show some evidence of, of uh, the ozone hole being present and measurable uh, with relatively simple held hand, uh, handheld instruments uh, off the back of the ship on clear days. Um, okay, that did not keep uh, some of our fellow passengers uh, from being uh, rather rambunctious about the exposure of their epidermis uh, to uh, ultraviolet radiation and the, uh, and the ozone hole. And these cruise ships love to take you to Deception Island uh, for uh, a, an Antarctic swim. Uh, so here we are, here's Lisa um, in the Antarctic Ocean. Uh, you'll notice that this water is being uh, fed by meltwater off the glaciers in the passes, uh, in, the, in, the, in the distance. Um, this is not, uh, you know, for the faint of heart. This is close to the Polar Bear Club. Um, it, with the exception is that Deception Island is a volcanically active island. It has a lot of geothermal heat uh, beneath it. And as the waters lap up on the beach, uh, they run into that geothermal heat and you see a whole lot of vaporization coming up. And so while I didn't swim myself, unless I was the picture taker here, uh, but while these people were swimming, uh, the crew of the ship will dig uh, what amounts to a hot tub in the, uh, in the shore here. So here's the ship, here's the, the uh, ice melting into the ocean and the swimmer, I don't have a swimmer in this particular shot, but uh, they've got the, uh, the hot tub being prepared. Um, I, of course, was ready there uh, with our oven thermometer uh, and measured 150 degrees Fahrenheit in this water. It's actually hotter than you'd want to get into. Uh, but swimmers uh, coming back from, the, uh, from this excursion were able to plop themselves down. Uh, and uh, so this was a, what, a 30, uh, I think it was close to a 35 degree Fahrenheit water uh, into 150 uh, Fahrenheit water within a few uh, yards. Uh, great fun. Um, although one thing I will say about Deception Island, uh, which was an old whaling station and whaling colony, is that there are uh, remembrances of uh, those past uh, that didn't come back from Deception Island um, from long ago. 
uh, all of our swimmers did. Lisa even has a certificate that said she did it. Back to penguins. I don't know whether I have a foot fetish or whatever, um, <laughs> but I got, I got fascinated by penguin feet um, as part of looking at penguins. Um, and um, you know, you may have memories of your grandmother having rather gnarly fingernails. Uh, the the penguin, penguins put anything like that to shame. Uh, and penguin feet, penguin feet are quite telling about the beast at hand. Uh, bright orange feet on Gen 2 penguins. Uh, a penguin which seems almost too happy to show you uh, its feet. Um, and perhaps its entire tuxedo uh, type uh, coating. Uh, but themselves, which are absolutely beautiful uh, animals where you get the feeling of true uh, animal behavior and animal uh, care for young uh, that is almost human-like. Um, and then you can look at uh, chinstrap penguins, uh, equally gnarly, but pink. Um, and uh, chinstraps uh, have uh, you know, all kinds of mechanisms. Uh, this one's got one young and one egg here. Um, I don't know whether that egg ever hatched, but it's clearly turning it and worried about whether it's going to hatch or not uh, in a way in which you can all sympathize and think about what it would be like to turn an egg with your mouth when your egg about as, is about as big as your mouth. Uh, but then uh, here's a chin staff penguin with its young uh, around uh, the edge of the, uh, edge of the nest. And then, of course, you can have Adelie penguins, and their feet are they're slightly pink but almost white, equally gnarly. Um, and Adelis are uh, penguins that are most associated with ice. Uh, they are one of the two species of penguins that are confined to breeding on the Antarctic continent uh, per se. They don't uh, extend up into Argentina or over into uh, New Zealand. Uh, again, with the, the wide eye ring and that childlike innocence of the whole situation. Uh, and uh, you can't help but love these guys. Uh, if you're on the Falklands, the King penguins have black feet, uh, and uh, I don't know how they've got all this worked out as they walk along the beach and they have some kind of organization to their society and pattern. Uh, I think the New Yorker cartoon may have captured this as well as anything. Uh, but the, the whole uh, concept of looking at penguins and looking at penguin behavior and penguin society uh, was one that absolutely fascinated me. Of course, I'm part birder uh, anyhow. Uh, but uh, it was obviously uh, the reason to go to Antarctica. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that face penguins. As we have a lot of ice melting in the Antarctic Ocean, and in fact a good index of additional ice melting may be some of these data, the salinity of seawater has been measurably declining. You're essentially putting fresh water off the ice pack into the ocean, it melts, and as it melts, it dilutes the salt water with a layer of fresh water. And so salinity is declining, not hugely. This is 30.4 parts per thousand parts. And these data over about five years or so, 10 years, I guess, uh, drop that down to 34.0. Temperature is increasing. These waters are not warm. 1.3 degrees centigrade, uh, increasing up to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But there's no doubt that's a, that's a trend of increasing warmth of the Antarctic waters. Uh, probably associated global warming. Uh, penguins feed very much in the ocean. They feed on krill. And if you look at the Antarctic continent uh, and look at krill in particular, uh, there's areas in which the abundance of krill uh, have decreased in red here over a two-fold decrease uh, in many areas, uh, in this case north and east of the Antarctic Peninsula extending up to the Falklands. Uh, in that also another large group down there is salps, uh, which uh, are not as preferred as food by, uh, particularly by Adelie penguins. They tend to have increased over some of the same areas. So there are changes going on in the Southern Ocean uh, that are certainly of some concern. Uh, I think these uh, data published last, uh, about a year ago, uh, in American scientists are very telling. Uh, the Gen 2 penguins, which are associated with uh, the peninsula do well, fairly well with warmer conditions and don't depend so much on sea ice, have dramatically increased in population numbers. That's kind of that brownish uh, line that's increasing. The Adelis, white eye circle, highly dependent on ice. That's the purple. 
uh, they've very dramatically uh, been declining. Um, and so as the Antarctic continent warms, I think we have every expectation uh, that there could be very strong changes in the abundance of some penguin species at the expense of others. Uh, these Adelie penguin uh, data are largely derived from a station that the National Science Foundation uh, maintains in Palmer on the Antarctic Peninsula uh, that welcomed us on one of uh, its, uh, our uh, stops. Uh, here we are all bundled up like penguins ourselves. Uh, but right near that station, there are Adelie colonies that have been studied for a number of years. Uh, the success of breeding, the longevity of adults, the number of young uh, per nest, uh, various kinds of uh, data that are important to understand the population biology of that species. This is a case for what we do in the temperate zone, what we may have even done driving over here tonight, putting some carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from our exhaust, to the extent that that warms the climate globally, plays out on the survival of a species that's thousands of miles from us tonight, but very much dependent on ice and very much dependent on krill and a lot of krill in the ocean water uh, for its feeding and survival and feeding of young uh, in a very short growing season. So our pollution locally affecting something globally. But as we did the Antarctic cruises, we were also very much struck and questioned ourselves, you know, is our very presence down here uh, potentially causing difficulty? All of that was brought to a head in the fall of 07 when the uh, cruise ship Explorer struck an iceberg, uh, rolled over in the course of a couple of days and sank, uh, mercifully with no loss of life. Uh, but it gave very much a feeling that, gee, we're intruding in a system. And our intrusions, to the extent that they might result in an oil spill or, or, or some such, would be incredibly difficult to mitigate that far and in those kinds of very difficult conditions. But even as we were visitors to Antarctica, there were questions, how close should you get to a penguin? The current Antarctic Treaty suggests something on the order of 15 feet. The cruise ships enforce that very well. They say, don't go within 15 feet, but if you stand quietly and the penguin comes to you, that's OK. Um, so there are some protocols, but uh, the database on which those protocols uh, have been established is relatively weak, uh, relatively poorly understood, uh, and certainly diverted deserving of further studies. Those are some wonderful tabular icebergs out there in the back. Um, questions as, as you go from island to island and visit different species of penguins in different places and walk through their guano and move from place to place, are you transporting various kinds of pests and pathogens from one place to another? The Antarctic Treaty and Protocol has uh, stipulations for an elaborate boot and uh, boot washing uh, in uh, salty Clorox uh, type water and then several rinses when you get uh, back from the ship. Uh, again, um, care is being taken, uh, but one can ask uh, what, what's the, uh, how, how successful is that in sterilizing one's boots uh, upon return from a visit. Uh, I happen to look back on our own ship uh, from ashore at one point, and I don't know what my first words were, but uh, you know, I know this is some kind of abuse that the Antarctic continent has not seen uh, until recent years uh, that reflects the tourist industry down there itself. So this is a beautiful place, and as we sailed down through Antarctica, uh, we were able to uh, have, uh, you know, we, we moved in relatively uh, wonderful warmth and comfort in Antarctic penguin pajamas with brandy. Uh, I was able to keep with a satellite phone in touch with my office reasonably uh, successfully, and my assistant at that time uh, loved hearing penguin noises in the background of our conversation. Uh, but very much as you're a visitor in Antarctica, you realize, and thinking back on it, that you have gone to a very distant place, entered an ecosystem uh, where humans really have no uh, native uh, reason to be there, and that you're very much a visitor in a true foreign land uh, while you're there. Uh, and as you leave, of course, you leave behind a system, in this case with Gen 2 penguins, that probably didn't care whether you came at all, and probably would have preferred that you not come and tramp through their breeding ground. And they're probably just as glad to see you go home 
uh, and they don't ask much of us. You know, that there would be krill in the ocean and a place to nest, and a Gen 2 penguin is probably reasonably happy uh, taking care of its young and going on for another life cycle. But you leave behind a very fragile ecosystem that I think is highly deserving of more attention than it's gotten uh, from environmental scientists, global change scientists, ecologists. Uh, luckily, there's some important scientific research going on there, uh, which I think will help uh, the management of that system. Uh, but it's very fragile, and anybody that's been there will realize that this is a very beautiful system uh, that I think deserves the attention, the stewardship of all of us. And I'm going to end there tonight, and hopefully you had something of the experience of being there. And I would urge any of you to get the chance to do it yourselves, to go ahead and say yes. Thank you. And it, as uh, the usual protocol, I'll be glad to take a few questions. Yes. Uh, to uh, the extent that I, it has a lot to do with the increased warmth of water. The, uh, the question is what what might be causing krill to go down. Now, of course, there's other uh, there's uh, overfishing of krill. Uh, that, uh, I mean, krill, uh, you can catch them in huge nets, um, and they're, they're made into fertilizer, and they're a food in Japan and in uh, Asia. Uh, so there's other things that have impacted krill, but uh, the warmth of water seems to have a lot to do with that. For Adeli penguins, the critical thing seems to be sea ice with krill underneath it. That's where they like to feed. And so you, you know, that's a double whammy, because sea ice you know, maybe it's not de declining dramatically, but there's some indications there's less of it and then a warmer water. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so we are there oz is there an oz or ozone hole over the North Pole and maybe everywhere? Um, first question is easy. There is a much less well-developed thinning of the ozone over the Arctic. It's nowhere near as dramatic over the, as over the South Pole. And the reason, believe it or not, the, the South Pole in the dark for six months at high altitude is much significantly colder in the stratosphere than elsewhere on the planet. Okay, then in the Arctic and, and over Millbrook, for instance, it's, you know, I'm, when you're at, when you're in a 747 at 30, 40,000 feet, you know, the pilot will tell you it's minus 50. But, and that's cold, but it's not cold enough to have a lot of ice crystals that are effective uh, in the reaction. Um, so you need, you need all three things, CFCs, ultraviolet light, and very cold. And you can see the minute, it comes on in the spring in Antarctica, but after spring's been on for six weeks or so, it begins to close up because even, even the stratosphere over Antarctica is beginning to warm, and you lose that one of those three ingredients. Yes? The replacements for Freon, well, they don't work quite as well, but you probably haven't noticed that yet. Uh, they are not um, without some ozone destruction potential. It's not like we eliminated this problem 100%. Uh, the replacement chemicals do, a, a smaller percentage of them, do persist a mix to the stratosphere. Uh, not, well, they're, they're all contribute to global warming. All those gases are, are radiative absorbing gases. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're better than what we had, but uh, we're not out of the water. The, the thing that I think is most important about the Montreal Protocol, besides getting rid of the really nasty ones, in terms of ozone destruction, is that it represented a time when the nations of the world got together in Montreal and said, this is bad. It's not bad for everybody, but we all play a role in it, and we ought to do something about it. And they did it. Now, it didn't do any harm that DuPont had another chemical where it was almost as good. Um, but it's a model that we ought to be using for our climate change negotiations. And, you know, I think it's, it's really too bad that Copenhagen and 
and uh, other such meetings haven't produced similar agreement. Yes? So the geology of Antarctica is highly varied. There's igneous rocks, there's sedimentary rocks. One of the cruises we uh, stopped at uh, where there were some sedimentary outcrops with fossils in them. There's big deposits of coal. There's putative deposits of oil. Uh, there's well-known uh, mineralized deposits of copper and gold. There's all kinds of things that you might think people would want. Um, luckily, it's been very expensive to fulfill that one, and so Antarctica's remained relatively uh, unexploited. Uh, and of course the treaty says that this belongs to everyone. You can't stake it out. Um, there's sectors that are where people are in charge, but uh, any? Uh, not that I know of. Yes? In, in terms of sea level rise, active underwater, underground, underwater volcanoes. Yeah. Well, you'd probably be thinking of bringing new water to the surface from deep in the earth. Oh, oh okay. Well, if you know, if we went into a an epoch, a geologic epoch, where there were lots of active volcanoes, and it melted a lot of the ice pack. Uh, that would cause a lot of sea level rise. And there's been epochs like that in the dirt, Earth's uh, distant past. Uh, but I don't think there's any indication that, there, that we've been seeing an increase in that kind of activity in the last couple hundred years. Uh, in the same way, I mean, a lot of people say, well, gee, the rise in CO2 in the atmosphere could be just greater volcanic activity. Uh, but the evidence for that is weak, and the uh, isotope ratio of the carbon and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere doesn't fit with what would come out of a volcano. Yep. Oh yeah, 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 global warming. I'm a, I'm a big believer that it, the plant, A, the planet is warming. Even the Wall Street Journal agrees to that now. Um, and B, that this is uh, something unusual that is uh, at least a fraction of it is due to human activity. Yeah, sweet. There's always uh, what we call that geothermal water. So the question is whether there's water deep in the earth that might be brought to the surface and presumably contribute to sea level rise. Actually, almost all the water on earth now in, on land, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, that was its origin. Um, you know, it basically was, was not delivered as a liquid to the surface uh, during the formation of the earth. It was what we call degassed out of the, out of the crust and mantle. Um, and that, that's a polite word for it. Um, the, uh, that uh, appears to have ended dominantly a couple of billion years ago. So I'm, you know, a little bit is probably still happening if you go to Iceland where there's active uh, deep mantle volcanoes um, and you see a plume of steam coming out. That's probably new water. It's never been on the surface before. Uh, but no indication that that is of any significant volume. Yes? Yes? <laughs> okay, a lot of questions there. Uh, first thing, about 97% of the... 
Yeah, well, I, I, I don't have that right uh, handy on my computer, but I'll pull some things out of my memory. Um, so 97% of the water on Earth is salt water. It's in the ocean in one form or another. 3% is fresh. Uh, almost all of the fresh water is frozen uh, on the uh, Greenland and Antarctic. Um, you know, probably 2.7% of, of that three is frozen. And so we exist on a very small sliver of the pie that's liquid fresh water that fuels all of the lakes, rivers, modern society's use of water, and the water content that's in the atmosphere. Now the water content in the atmosphere, you may wonder why I remember all this stuff and I did it better when I was younger, but uh, the water in the atmosphere doesn't spend more than about 10 days in the atmosphere. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't re even really circulate globally, which is why it rains in different amounts in different places. Um, and that is because of the, the vapor pressure capacity of the atmosphere, that, that essentially the atmosphere has a finite capacity of the hole before it starts raining. Um, so the idea that we could put a substantial amount of water into the atmosphere as it gets warmer, um, you know, it, it'll hold that a warmer atmosphere will hold more water, but it will be just a minuscule amount. And uh, and so that isn't a good way to uh, uh, think about uh, cooling the planet, you know, with a reflectivity of water. Yeah. Okay, so question is desalinization. Uh, could we do it? Uh, would it be significant? Would it, would it add, uh, make significant quantities of water more available? Uh, certainly we can do it. Uh, I've not seen a way of doing it without a fair amount of energy. Uh, so of course where it's being done now is uh, in the Middle East where they got lots of fossil fuel energy and lots of solar uh, thermal energy where you can use the sun to, yeah. Um, but it, um, you know, I, I, the chance of doing that globally for six billion people, it'll help. I think it'll be regional, uh, regionally useful, useful uh, but very expensive in terms of energy uh, use. Oh, I'd be surprised if, it, if you could desalinate enough of the ocean uh, to raise the salinity of the remaining ocean. You know, you'd be taking some of it out as fresh water and leaving the salt behind. Boy, if the environmental problems we face today, that's way, way down on my list is uh, a, 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 too, a hyper saline ocean. It's possible, but um, you know, I'd worry about running out of phosphorus and oil and stuff like that uh, way before. See, my voice is about shot, but I'll take one back there. There's a young hand back there. Oh, my. You know, I'm going to, I got to take the fifth. I have no idea. <laughs> you, st you stumped the teacher on that one. Um, you know? There's un Uncle Arctica was somewhere else, but no, I, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that'd be interesting to look. I'd start with start with Wikipedia. What's that? Uh, do we have an answer? Okay. Okay. Is that Greek or Latin? Okay, Oakley, we expect to see pictures of you uh, in your swimming trunks. Um, you know. Bring, bring them back. We'll put them on the website. <laughs> Thanks you all for coming tonight, and uh, good to have you here.